You're now listening to episode 32 of the Real Estate CPA Podcast. Your source for all things real estate, accounting, and tax. Here, we reveal our secrets that can save you thousands in taxes, streamline your accounting process, and help grow your business. Stay tuned to hear insightful interviews with industry experts, successful real estate investors, and current clients on what strategies they use to grow their business and how they steer clear of Uncle Sam. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Brandon Hall and Thomas Costelli here today with Taylor Brugna, a CPA and CFO specialist with our firm, but he's also an investor himself. We're going to discuss how he built a real estate portfolio of over 60 plus units in his 20s, the systems he uses to manage it all, and how he analyzes his portfolio. Taylor works with real estate investors, developers, and private equity funds as a CFO, providing tax strategy, accounting consulting, and financial analysis. As an investor himself, Taylor believes that perfecting the accounting and tax functions will lead to making good decisions that are crucial for the success of the business. Taylor owns and operates over 60 plus units in the Tampa Bay area and has no plans of slowing down. Before we jump right into today's episode, we want to remind you about our virtual workshops. They are not a webinar but rather our virtual workshops are a highly interactive experience that puts you in a room with our tax strategists as well as fellow real estate investors. We will discuss a topic for the first 15 to 20 minutes and then open the room up for questions. This is the perfect opportunity to get answers to those real estate tax and accounting questions that you've been dying to ask, while at the same time discovering what other real estate investors are asking. You could sign up for our virtual workshops by visiting therealestatecpa.com backslash virtual dash workshop or by following the link in the show notes below. And without further ado, let's jump right into today's episode. So Taylor, thanks for joining us today. Would you mind giving us a little bit uh, of information about your background, how you got started in real estate? Yeah, of course. So uh, first of all, thanks for having me. Uh, I was starting to get jealous being a member of the firm. And then I see all of these cool, interesting podcasts going on. And I was not asked. So appreciate that. Uh, but um, so a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a CPA here at the firm, of course. I started investing in real estate uh, during college. I originally had a eBay business that actually I started in in high school, I was fortunate that it took off and uh, it, it started doing well. I sold clothing to customers that were overseas. And as I graduated college and started working full time at PwC, I realized that the time commitment of, of kind of running both a full time job and a business was overwhelming. So I was really looking for a way to generate passive income. And our real estate was just a perfect fit for me. Um, I started doing research on on certain markets, uh, uh, certain types of investing that, that I wanted to do. And it really, the, the love of real estate started there. So quick question on that. So when you, when you started the eBay business, is that how you got the seed capital to go into the real estate side of the things? Exactly. Yeah. So I was a, a three sport athlete for most of my uh, high school career. And then it was it was senior year, uh, spring semester, and I decided that I didn't want to run track anymore because it was it was torture at that point. Uh, I was I was close to graduating. I just wanted to have fun. But then I realized also that I needed a job and it was it was time to make some money. So um, instead of getting a a regular job, I decided to start buying clothing at a discount at a, at various different outlet centers. And then I would just resell it on eBay. Um, I was fortunate that I, I found in a market, I guess, that was really popular at the time. So it was really just like Nike, Adidas, any kind of sportswear, things like that, North Face. And um, it grew to the, the point where I was traveling all down the East Coast to all different outlet stores. And just buying in bulk. So at one point, I, I would just have a van. I would drive down to, to say, Virginia, North Carolina. Uh, I'd fill up the van and just come back up to New York and start taking inventory and, and selling things. Nice. nice. So when you first got started in real estate, what did you start investing in? And why did you choose what you invested in? Sure. So I took the approach at the time. So I, I was a, a senior in college, I believe. And... I wanted something that was relatively low risk. And so the approach that I took was to invest in condominium units. So I started with 
a condo unit. It was a two bed, one bath in Tampa. And um, it was a, a particular complex that was still suffering from the recession and there was a lot of foreclosures. So the asking price on it was only $30,000. So by no means was I an expert at this point in my career. I was still in college, still finishing up my um, accounting degree, starting to study for the CPA. But I thought that a $30,000 investment was, you know, I, I was concerned about the return and performance of, cost, of course, but I really thought that it would be a good experience and a good learning experience for me to kind of get started. So the first four properties I bought actually were in this complex. Um, they all were in that 30K range. And actually, um, about six months ago, I just did a 1031 exchange uh, for all four of them out. And they they uh, doubled in value since. Wow, nice. Okay. So you started off with these condos. And did you move into single family and then multifamily? Or did you just go straight into multifamily? Yeah, so it was it was a very natural progression between I guess starting small and then trying to go uh, larger as I went along. So started with condos. I realized that that wasn't the particular strategy that I wanted to go with uh, for. Although I have seen it work for a ton of different people and a lot of our clients, but I moved from condo units to single family to small multifamily, and then at this point in my career, I'm trying to move on to a little bit larger multifamily. So you've invested across multiple different types of real estate. Which asset class do you like the best? Sure. So they all have their pros and cons, I think. I think if we if we start with condos, the obvious con is that you're you're paying a maintenance fee no matter what every month. It's fairly consistent. But I think a, a pro to that is that you don't have to worry too much about the exterior maintenance, things like that. So you don't run into too many maintenance headaches. However, I think I wanted a little bit more control over how I handled maintenance. And I think that kind of ruled out the condo strategy. I think, I think single family homes, uh, uh, family homes, excuse me, are great as well. But with me being so busy at work, of course, being a full-time CPA, it takes a lot of management to be able to scale a single family operation. So then by process of, of elimination, really, it led me to small multifamily. So two to four units is the, the target these days. Got it. So kind of going for the economy of scale, it looks like. Exactly. Okay. What is the future? What does your future look like right now? What would you say you know, your, your goal is for the next 12 months, your goal for the next five years, if you had, it, if you had, a, had sure. a guess? Sure. So... I absolutely love working here at the Real Estate CPA, and um, I see this as my long-term future. So I think I'm running into a unique situation here where I've got roughly about 50 units. And I think if I continue on the path of acquiring these two to four unit properties, that it's going to get, from an operations perspective, a bit complex to handle on my own. So I think going forward, if I want to invest in in more deals, there'll be larger projects that I can maybe take on with a partner. I might try to syndicate deals because now that people have have seen a little bit of my product and I guess to uh, some degree a a success story out of a certain market, um, I'm getting friends and, and colleagues that are interested in pulling money together to do a larger project. Very nice. So your brand is expanding. Uh, you know, I hear, I hear Thomas here is pretty solid on the syndication game. So I don't know. It sounds like there's some synergies there that need to be explored. <laughs> I mean, hey, look, I'm planning to, uh, you know, I've, I've said it before, I'm planning to move to Florida. So I think you know, there <laughs> definitely be some, some synergies there for sure. We have a, uh, a running joke at our firm here that anybody that moves out of New York City and into a tax-free state such as Florida, I will split the tax savings with them. <laughs> Heard it here first, folks. If, if either one of these guys, <laughs> both live in New York City, if they, either one of them moves, they will get a bonus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, so Tom and I are uh, are grabbing dinner next week, actually, and I think uh, uh, syndications are going to be a big part of the discussion and and see if we can work together. I think it'd be cool. awesome. Like I can't wait to hear how all of that goes and what comes of it. So you mentioned operations, and that's a good segue into our next kind of portion here of the podcast. You mentioned that you have about fifty units. You're also working full time here at the firm. 
uh, and I know that you work a lot here at the firm. You're dealing with really big clients, helping them manage their accounting and doing some CFO stuff for them as well. How do you manage your own stuff? Uh, you, you don't have a lot of time. So what are you doing to efficiently manage the 50 units all the way from you know, just random technology that you might be using or accounting? Yeah, so I think I was really big from the beginning, um, even with the first four units in, in colleges that I bought that I knew that I was going into a big four accounting firm type environment where I was going to be working those 60, 70 hour weeks and I wouldn't have much time to kind of sit there and, and self-manage properties. So I really focused on building out a strong team. And for me, I was confident that I had the accounting and tax side down, but I made sure that I found an attorney that I was comfortable with. I made sure I found a broker I was comfortable with. And I made sure I found a property manager that I was comfortable with as well. And to find a team while investing remotely is fairly challenging. Um, it's a, I was, the, the due diligence process can be a bit stressful at times. But once you find a team that works, I think it really comes down to just putting uh, trust in them and, and, and then really letting them do their job. Um, on the accounting and tax side, I just have a calendar block once a week to kind of just run through how the business is going. And I make sure that everything is as automated as, as humanly possible. So I love QuickBooks Online. I love that all of the bank transactions pull automatically. Um, and I use along with my uh, property management software. So I, I use Buildium uh, and I love that. So I, I, I think those two pieces of technology really help me stay uh, passive in the business. Since you, know, you do the CFO side of our business, what are some key performance indicators that you look for on properties you own to kind of give you an idea of how they're performing compared to the other ones? Sure. I, I think every investor will have a bunch of different, uh, I would call them metrics that we're using to, to measure performance. Uh, for me, I'm, I'm financing uh, pretty standard uh, 30% down commercial loans at this point. So I like to look at uh, cash on cash return as, as one of them. Um, if I'm doing a larger project that's going to have a big cash outlay in the beginning, I'll look at... Uh, IRR. Um, it, it really depends on the project and the capital structure that you decide to use. But, uh, but uh, for me, cash on cash return is probably the easiest way to compare across my portfolio. Well, what if you go in all cash versus debt heavy? Does that affect the, I guess, the numbers that you're looking at there? If you're, if you're looking at that cash on cash return, how does that change the buying decision? Oh yeah, of course. So, so for me, I, I at this point, I kind of have a system down. I've built a relationship with a lender that I'll stick to the thirty percent down, finance seventy percent fairly consistently. So, cash on cash return works well for me because it's consistent across the entire portfolio. With that being said, if you're paying a hundred percent cash for a property. Uh, that particular return is going to drop significantly. And uh, in turn, it may not be the metric that is best for your business. So of course, a metric like cash on cash, if you're going to be completely leveraged, um, it's infinite. And then as soon as you go to pay all cash, it, it'll, it'll, it'll decrease significantly from there as well. When you, so when you've used these metrics in the past, have you had to come to the point yet where you've had to analyze your portfolio and decide which properties to, say, cut and which ones to keep or maybe which areas to double down on based on the performance of your various properties? Sure. Yeah. So I'll analyze my, my portfolio in a few different ways. But one of the ways that I, I really like to do it is uh, submarket. So I'm pretty much mostly in the Tampa Bay area, but within Tampa Bay, there's Clearwater, there's, there's Largo, there's St. Petersburg, and, and then there's the, the actual city of Tampa as well. So I like to analyze the portfolio across those four regions. I like to uh, compare performance against the type of property. So as I mentioned earlier, um, I've got quite a, a varying uh, types of investments from a single family homes to eight unit apartment buildings. So it's always good to be able to compare uh, different sizes as well. 
So Taylor, obviously you're a CPA and you work here at the real estate CPA. Taxes are always a big topic of discussion amongst all of our employees. What are some specific tax strategies that you are utilizing with your own portfolio? Sure. I think for me and particularly investors in that that small multifamily and down range, that uh, de minimis safe harbor is um, is definitely one of my favorites. Can you explain what the de minimis safe harbor is? Absolutely. So pretty much if you have an expense for $2,500 or less, you can um, expense that in the in the year that it was incurred as opposed to having to capitalize it and depreciate it over a period of time. So uh, for example, if you have a foreign job that costs $2,000, you are able to take it in year one and take all of that savings right away. Um, If you had a $6,000 job, you may have to capitalize it and depreciate it over a certain useful life, depending on the type of flooring that it is. Exactly. And to elaborate on the de minimis safe harbor, it is a per item on the invoice rule. So if I buy 10 laptops and all 10 laptops together cost $10,000, but each separate laptop is $1,000 each, I can deduct all of the laptops, even though the total invoice amount is $10,000 because each item on the invoice is less than $2,500, as you said. But there is an anti-abuse rule, and I just want to make people aware of that. If you were to buy a new HVAC, for instance, and the HVAC costs $5,000, well, that does not qualify for the de minimis safe harbor. But what people have asked us in the past is, can I break out the casing, the motor, the tubing that goes into the HVAC, can I break all those out on the invoice and get them all below 2,500 bucks each? And the answer is no, because all of those components are feeding into the one major unit of property, which is the HVAC system. So in most cases, it is per item on the invoice, unless all of those components on the invoice are are feeding into that, uh, that major unit of property there. So just something to be aware of there, but good stuff. Anything else that you're using on the tax side? Sure. So I, I'll go into two things. The the first thing is kind of an indirect tax strategy, so to speak, in the sense that it's keeping clean books. So I don't necessarily think that it's a tax strategy that can, can of course, uh, save you money right away. But by keeping clean books on a consistent basis, you're able to constantly review your tax situation month over month or or week over week even depending on how your business you know how it's growing and what it looks like um i think i've been able to make certain decisions because i've i've kept books current and up to date on a weekly basis where a lot of our clients when they first join they don't really look at their books very often and it might be a once every six month process or once a year process for some people I think the tax strategy and the accuracy of your financials go hand in hand. So then something else I'll, I'll, I'll just throw out there is something that I, I love doing um, is that if a property is substantially complete, I like to advertise it for rent as soon as possible. So I can start deducting some of those minor repair expenses as opposed to having to capitalize them. So, uh, Brandon, I, I, I don't know if you want to I'm elaborate a bit more on that or if you want me to. No, I, no, no you did a great job. That sounds good. And I know that you, especially of all people here in the firm, are really big on making sure that people have clean books and are operating their accounting function effectively. So, yeah, very, very good to hear. Taylor, how much of a role do you think your accounting background plays in your understanding of being able to keep clean books? And would you do your books yourself if you didn't have an accounting background? So I think I can do my books fairly efficiently. And at some point, I think it'll still make sense to outsource it. But uh, at the current size of my portfolio, uh, I can bang it out in a couple hours, no problem. That being said, if I didn't have the accounting background, I would be making sure that I had a team member in place that could help me kind of make these decisions and make sure that these books are reconciled on a, on a regular basis. Because I'm very big on on focusing on the tasks that are high value tasks for me, and uh, it's really finding good deals is how a rental real estate business makes the most money. But because I have 
the accounting skill set, it's fairly efficient for me to do it myself. But if I didn't have that, I would want to spend more time on these high value tasks, like networking with with other people in the business, finding good deals, things like that. Yeah, it's highest and best use of your time, right? And exactly. if highest and best use of your time is doing your own books because you are an accountant by trade and you can do it much more efficiently and accurately than anybody else, then that's the highest and best use. At a certain point, you might be trying to raise money. And then at that point, the question is, is that the highest and best use of your time to be doing the books and worrying about the books? Or do you just outsource it and focus on the things that are going to grow the business significantly? Yeah, I love that. That's definitely something to be considering there. Um, You mentioned QuickBooks Online. Is there any piece of technology that you use in your real estate investing that you just absolutely love? So I I think two of these are fairly obvious, but uh, QuickBooks Online and property management software are my two uh, uh, favorite pieces of tech to use. The third is, uh, it's relatively simple as well, but it's YouTube. So being a remote investor, I rely a lot on my team on the ground to kind of loop me in on what's going on day to day. If there's any new properties that come up, I love being able to to see videos of of, uh, of what's going on, and um, I I rely heavily on watching these videos on a regular basis to uh, make decisions. Well, I think it's great advice. Would you have any other advice that you think that the listeners uh, should know, or you know, would help them in their careers? Yeah, so I I think a, a lot of investors that are just getting started, they have what's called. Um, analysis paralysis <laughs> tough to say right tongue twister but i'm so thankful that my senior year of college i, I was really motivated to kind of just jump in and and give this thing a shot um like i said earlier uh in the podcast i was by no means an, an expert um at that point of in time i had a lot of learning to do and i think sometimes you can only analyze a deal so much and uh, trust me be, being a, a CPA and working in our in our CFO services line, I'm about as analytical and, and data driven as they come. But I also think at some point you need to pull the trigger and and just start learning. A hundred percent agree with what you just said there. Um, I feel like I had the same issues when I first got started analysis paralysis. So that's definitely great advice. And um, go out there and take action, um, Taylor. We appreciate you coming on today to the podcast and. Um, Look forward to uh, working with you on that syndication in the future. Uh, Thanks again. Thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to today's show. If you enjoyed the show, please find us on iTunes and leave us a review. You can also email us at contact at therealestatecpa.com with any feedback or topic suggestions. We are always taking on new clients. And with the new tax laws in play, You really don't want to navigate this alone. Let us help you save money on taxes with your accounting and CFO needs. To become a client, navigate to our client page at therealestatecpa.com and fill out a web form with as much detail about your situation as possible. Thanks so much for listening. Have a great rest of your week.